Hi guys. All right. Well, welcome back to Peruvian Plunge, where we are finding ourselves in Puerto Maldonado, Peru, trying to uh, head back towards Cusco here at the opening of Chapter 19, titled Through the Gates of Hell with a small quote from uh, the little book, Becoming. The question arises as to what others will be doing while those committed to birthing the new paradigm of experience are focused within that process. They will be creating the necessary chaos that will allow for change. That is a big job, creating chaos. And we're going to pick up on the morning of Wednesday, June 17th, 2009, in Puerto Maldonado, Peru. Four hours after drifting off to sleep a second time at Hotel Moderno, I was catapulted awake by my old nemesis. A sound which, incredibly, I had never heard once in over a month in Peru. The rabid crowing of a rooster who had apparently mistaken a distant street light for the rising sun, scheduled to appear in about four more hours. Someday, I will cock-a-doodle-doo a full-fledged rant on the bizarre and confused circadian rhythms of Latin American roosters. Please, God, make it stop. I almost sobbed into my pillow. The crowing of the brainless rooster, who sounded close enough to be in the bed with me, was joined by the equally irritating, ragged snoring of the drunk gringo in the cell next door, sleeping off his glass-cutting woody visions amid sweet and anaconda-spotted wet dreams. Shit, I should have stuck it out with the honking horns and the damn parrots, I grumbled as I <clears throat> dug through my <coughs> luggage for my earplugs and dragged the raspy white noise of the phlegmatic fan closer to my ears. It was hopeless. The only dreams I had were those insomniac nightmares of dreaming that you cannot fall asleep. I gave up. The ghost of sleep at 7 a.m. and stumbled groggily down the sidewalk to the plaza for my savior cup of coffee. As I slurped, slowly resurfacing the beta wave consciousness, I began to notice one, then two, then ten, then one hundred, then five hundred moto taxis. Literally two wheeled taxis that can fit small third-world villages onto their two-person seats beginning to arrive at the square. By the time I'd finished my overcooked fried egg sandwich, the street was jammed with hundreds of freshly scrubbed red, yellow, and blue Chinese-made moto taxis. A battalion of cops patrolled the swelling but peaceful crowd. Bleachers began sprouting in the plaza, and a huge banner proclaiming some kind of National Moto Taxi Driver Pride Day was unfurled. At least, I think, the great mystery of the previous evening's motorcycle ballet was solved. It was nothing more than just your run-of-the-mill Peruvian Chinese-made Moto Taxi Parade. The only mystery remaining was where the hell all the women passengers had come from. The most sobering thing about the gala fiesta was that, had it not been for the huge banner, it never would have crossed my mind that there was such a thing as a moto taxi. It was now almost 8 a.m., which meant I had almost six hours to kill before my bus pulled out for Cusco. The reason for this outrageous insult to my gringo Virgo sense of proportion and balance was due to a masterful truce between Peru, Peru Brazil, and China 
that works something like this. Due to the virtual army of construction workers and planet-eating equipment clogging the new highway to hell between Puerto Maldonado and Cusco, it was, for all intents and purposes, impossible and perhaps illegal, I was never able to determine, for buses to squeeze through the nightmarish 60-mile bottleneck during daylight hours. <clears throat> As the worst of the bottleneck began four hours west of Puerto Maldonado, westbound buses were not allowed to leave until 2 p.m., at which time a whole pack of buses headed out en masse for the 18-hour creep across the mountains. <clears throat> this turn of events meant that some of the most gorgeous scenery in Peru would be crossed in the middle of the night, and it also meant I would not be able to witness firsthand perhaps the single biggest example of planet-eating excess on the entire planet. The only way to get around this Catch-22 was to take the big bus to the hellhole of Matsuko, get a hotel there for the night, and continue on the next morning in an expensive eight-seat microbus, although the thought of this held about as much appeal as a positive test for dengue fever, it was the reluctant choice I made. <clears throat> to while away this momentary setback in my revolution of consciousness I was fomenting, I ducked inside an internet cafe to check in with my tribe or what remained of them in my life in South Austin, Texas. Someday I will write a novel about this gang which will no doubt get me excommunicated. For now, suffice it to say that they are the greatest bunch of lovable lunatics on the planet. It had taken me 40 years of wandering the world as a neurotic, socially retarded loner and borderline hermit to find my tribe. And when I found them, what did I do? I abandoned them to run off to the Amazon jungle where I had immediately devolved back into the neurotic, socially retarded loner and borderline hermit that I'd been for 40 years before I met them. Life is funny that way, ain't it? <clears throat> Make no mistake about it. The single biggest challenge hands down of plunging ahead with this absurd, chaotic quest is not the endless rain or the bugs or the Montezuma's revenge or the language barrier or even the swag weed. It is the relentless daily and nightly grind of abject loneliness I brought upon myself by walking away from the people I love to go pick to go kick big oil out of the Peruvian Amazon. Why can't big oil just leave the fucking jungle alone and go invade South Austin instead so I can go back home and kick their asses from there? Since I have no previous experience of being part of a tribe, I'm still in the process of learning the rules of the game on the eve of my 50th birthday. And rule number one of the tribal game <coughs> appears to be that if you banish yourself from the tribe, you can't complain when the other members of your tribe, the people you love like family, abandon you right back. I'm as guilty of this abandonment of others who have voluntarily left the tribe before me as anyone, so I have no right to complain when people do it to me. Five days before I left South Austin, I co-hosted a New Year's Eve party with a friend whom I love as much as my own blood sister where I bet close to 100 people told me they loved me and hugged me goodbye. Of these folks, I would count perhaps two dozen of them as family. You know, real soul brothers and sisters. 
within three months of pulling out of South Austin, I could count on one hand the number of folks who bother to email me more than one sentence per month. If that, during the same period, membership in my Chicken Little Society group plummeted from 112 folks to 40. Meanwhile, membership in my eJammers music group, a group I had created so tribal members could keep each other informed about upcoming parties in Austin, has remained steady at over 250. At first, I was really hurt by this abandonment, but after discussing the matter with spirit and detaching myself from my bruised ego to look at the situation objectively, I realized that I could be gone for four years from my tribe, and the day I get back, I will be lovingly welcomed back into the fold amid a great fanfare of homecoming hugs and kisses and smiles from folks who have not spoken to me in years, whether I'm gone one year or four, within a week of my return to South Austin, it will be like I never left, and this long, strange trip to Peru will be little more than a hazy, crazy dream. These were my emotions as I stepped inside an internet cafe in Puerto Maldonado, Peru on that slow Wednesday morning in the jungle. Imagine my surprise then when I clicked on my inbox to find not one, not two, not three, but four messages from close friends in Austin who I had not heard one word from in weeks. All four of them were members of my eJammers party group. Two had never joined my Chicken Little Society group, and the other two had dropped out in April, having heard quite enough of my tiresome rants about personal responsibility, apocalyptic visions of the future, and planet-wide revolutions in consciousness. My friends were not checking in just to say, Hi, Hambone, we miss you. No, they had pursued me halfway around the planet to alert me to some shocking, heartbreaking news from my beloved South Austin. Responding to complaints about noise from neighbors, the Austin Police Department had swooped down on a local hamburger joint and pulled the plug on an outdoor concert by Jimmy Never Is A Moment Lafave. My fellow tribe members were duly incensed and outraged at this gross fascist abuse of the police state and were spearheading a petition drive to carry their righteous indignation over the incident to City Hall where they intended to demand redress of their grievances and to return the constitutionally protected right to enjoy live music while munching on dead cows to all South Austinites. They had all forwarded along a copy of the petition for me to sign, comfortable in the knowledge that Hambone Little Tail, of all people, would surely hop on their bandwagon of protest. Guys, I must sheepishly admit I shirked my South Austin tribal duty of personal responsibility. Not only did I not sign their silly little petition, I didn't even click on the attachment to read it, just as not one of them had ever once clicked on any of the links to Chicken Little Society, which describe the myriad ways the sky is going to fall on the earth and destroy us all, while everybody is stuffing their faces with cheeseburgers, listening to Jimmy LaFave sing old Bob Dylan protest songs. Not that I'm keeping score, of course. I just sat there glumly in front of the computer, staring at the message, <clears throat> at the messages every one of them sent to me by intelligent, aware, engaged, socially and politically active participants of the progressive South Austin scene, not knowing 
whether to laugh or cry as my own pathetic, laughable visions of saving the planet by fomenting a revolution in consciousness crumbled further into oblivion. Logging trucks bearing the bloody wooden corpses of Gaia's children lumbered by on the street outside the internet cafe. Hundreds of moto taxi drivers celebrated the good life a block away. Hundreds of gallons of mercury floated down the Mother of God River four blocks away. Chainsaw screams and fires raged out of control in the jungle halfway to the Atlantic Ocean. Planet Eaters were dynamiting the Andes to ram a road to China. The burnt corpses of dead Indians rotted in shallow graves up near the Ecuador border so big oil could keep those pipelines open and the drilling rigs pumping. But hey, half a planet away, my friends, we're fighting hard, keeping live music alive in the live music capital of the world, so all hope for the planet was not yet lost. You belong to a tribe of partying musicians in South Austin, Hambone. What do you want or expect from them? Spirit, who had sent me on this madcap adventure in the first place, whispered over my left shoulder, You are the fucking doomsday prophet, not them. Get over it. I moved along to mangabay.com, the single greatest rainforest conservation website on the planet, and spent the next hour studying, of all subjects, the sad and tragic story of oil and gas exploration in the western Amazon. I forwarded the piece over to Chicken Little Society in the vain hope that someone out there in the wilderness might actually get halfway through it. <clears throat> As checkout time at the Hotel Moderno was 11 a.m., I bade farewell to my South Austin tribe and headed back across the Moto Taxi Jammed Plaza. The giant banner had been rolled up, the morning's festivities were winding down, and now the hundreds of proud taxi drivers were trying to locate their steeds among the hundreds of almost identical motorbikes to begin their road rally to Cusco down the highway to hell, scheduled to kick off at noon. Of course, the guys in the middle of the pack were hopelessly trapped by the outlying concentric circles of other moto taxis, but all in all, everyone seemed to be negotiating the pandemonium with good humor and cheer. I made one last defensive pause at the modern seatless commode before embarking on my multi-hour bus odyssey. The best offense before a long Peruvian bus ride is a good defense. I loaded my bag of cannonballs and headed outside to flag down a tuk-tuk. Of course, since all the smooth, wide streets around the plaza were jammed with moto taxis, the traffic cops shunted us off onto a series of pothole-plague side streets that would have given the Lunar Rover a run for its money. My steel nerve toot toot captain persevered as I clung to my bag of cannonballs to keep it from toppling off the seat into a Puerto Maldonado mud puddle. Within minutes, we emerged in the three-block line of bus companies competing for passengers bound for Cusco. I asked the driver for his recommendation. He cruised along the parada of roughly identical crapshoot Peruvian bus car choices until he came to a lime green sleek beauty with the name Juanita Shirley emblazoned across the front. This would be my recommendation, amigo, he announced with a wan smile, indicating with a roll of his eyes a giggling gaggle of 14 flat-out gorgeous young 20-something women, any one of whom could have waltzed her way onto Peruvian idol congregating in front of the terminal. 
Jesus, where did these girls come from? Good recommendation, amigo, I agreed. I paid my $5 fare, stashed my bag of cannonballs on the Playboy bunny bus, and cruised the two blocks back to the highway to hell to enjoy the moto taxi parade. I was not to be disappointed as I munched away on a steaming plate of chicken and rice. I was treated to the spectacle of a full marching band leading the army of Chinese super scooters down the already busy main drag of town, creating a nightmarish traffic jam in every direction. The final wave of moto taxis retreated into the western horizon, and I retreated back to the bus station. I climbed aboard Juanita Shirley a half hour early to stake my claim beside a window to the destruction and to wait to see which delectable young tart would be my seatmate for the five-hour journey to Mazuko. One by one and two by two, the caramel-colored little foxes filed onto the bus, their f firm, young, filly breasts straining against the fabric of their assorted tight t-shirts. I could see them eyeing the seat choices, and like a pathetic, over-the-hill cock of the rock, with one too many feathers missing from his fiery orange crown, I silently beckoned one of them, any of them, to sit down next to me. But, alas, it was not to be. Soon, all fourteen of them had settled their cute little bunny bubble butts into other seats. Indeed, by the time the driver fired up his engine and gave the three-minute warning toot, there was only one empty seat remaining on the bus. Guess which one? The driver popped the brake, and he'd just begun to roll when there was a shout from outside the bus. The door hissed open, and onto the bus staggered a half-drunk, toothless old fart in filthy clothes and a beat-up old Jed Clampett hat who was the shoe-in for a Peruvian version of Walter Brennan. He had no problem choosing which seat to take, as there was only one left on the bus. As luck would have it, we were the very first bus out of the starting gate, the leader of the pack. The driver was just beginning to pick up speed on the edge of town when we rolled into a police checkpoint. We had been waved right on through this very checkpoint two days earlier, and the drunk beside me assured me this would be a 10-second formality. Indeed, the driver started to roll right on through with a wave and a smile to the bored-looking cops who clearly were not stopping any other traffic. When a pot-bellied armed cop suddenly hopped out of his cop stupor, blew his puny little cop whistle, and waved us over to the shoulder. Oh shit, here comes real trouble. Putting on his meanest, toughest governor of California scowl, he should have taken lessons from Kurtzita Ratcheta so swaggered onto the bus, instantly recognizing that he had just hit the Playboy Bunny bus jackpot, and wanting to prolong the moment, he barked out his puny little cop orders for all of us to get off the bus and line up outside. Grumbling, we began filing off the bus as the second bus in the pack rolled right on through the checkpoint without a hitch. Fatso told Flocko, the skinny cop, to search the bags in the luggage hold while he checked everyone's papers for undotted I's and uncrossed T's. As Fatso worked his way down the line of Playboy buddies, I stood there in sphincter-clenched terror as Flocko worked his way closer and closer to my bag of cannonballs which contained, of course, my bag of weed that could have sent me to prison for five years. Thank Gaia 
when he reached it at the very back of the luggage bin and felt how heavy it was, he had no desire to wrestle it out into the hot sun. De donde? Where are you from? growled Fatso when he got to me. Tejas, I said. Austin Tejas. I never answer the United States when asked this question. Ah, Alstine Tejas, he growled. He crowed, breaking into a cop smile. Wheelie Nelson, Jorge Bush, no? See, si, see, si, I said, smiling along with him. I decided this probably wasn't the most opportune time to inform Fatso that normal spokesperson Wheelie Nelson has gone on public record. The Alex Jones Show, of all places, Google it, calling Jorge Bush correctly a mass murderer and fingering him as a co-conspirator in the World Trade Center inside demolition job. Thirty minutes after rolling into a 30-second police checkpoint, and now fourth in the pack, Juanita Shirley rolled back out again, and we were finally back on the road. As, as we were finally on the road again, as Wheelie Nelson would say, rolling along the smooth ribbon of asphalt in the comfort of a modern bus car, listening to the soft Peruvian folk music issuing from the speakers, it would have been such a simple thing to follow the lead of my blissfully ignorant Playboy Bunny bus mates and to lean back in my soft reclining seat like I was rolling across a Kansas wheat field on Interstate 40, which I may as well have been judging by the number of trees outside. If I, like more than half the folks on the bus with window seats, had simply shut the curtains against the harsh equatorial sun that until just recently had shone on an unbroken canopy of treetops 100 feet above the new roadbed, I would not have had to face the harsh reality of the ruined and ravaged landscape the ragged gray skeletons of the few trees that had been deemed unworthy of sawing down, the monstrous line of road graders and steamrollers and dump trucks and the army of fluorescent orange, ju orange jumpsuited construction workers. Why do you do this to yourself, you idiot? I screamed to myself. Do you think that one other person on this fucking bus gives one shit that this sun-blasted, Gaia-forsaken, weed-choked cattle ranch we're barreling across was for millions of years home to hundreds, if not thousands, of species? How many of these cute little clueless bimbos whose recent ancestors lived in this forgotten forest, though they would deny their Indian ancestry as all Peruvians do, want to join your stupid little revolution in consciousness to save this planet from folks like the planet eaters that are building this very road you are taking as part of your fight to kick the planet eaters out of the jungle. I felt like jumping out of my seat and screaming, 100 soles to the first person on this bus who can tell me where the million acre threatened Amaracari communal reserve is. Answer, outside the window, just the other side of this cattle ranch. Or, 100 soles to the first person who can tell me who Hunt Oil Company is, or for that matter, who is paying for this billion dollar road. It was, of course, just a ham bone, doom and gloomy fantasy. Not one person on the bus, with the possible exception of the driver, would have had any clue or would have given a shit why the crazy gringo is so upset. Those damn gringos always whining about some little drama. So instead, I contented myself with looking out the window at the scenery rolling by 
And what a scene it was as we barreled westward into the setting sun, passing mile after mile of, gi of giant planet-eating metallic monsters and the otherworldly army of Daglo orange jumpsuited construction workers in their bright hard hats looking like so many cocks, and hence there were a surprising number of women on the work crew of the rock strutting about on their various piles of rocks. I could understand the bright orange jumpsuits, but never figured out exactly what the helmets were supposed to be protecting the workers from. Certainly not falling branches or trees, that's for damn sure. Of the hundreds of workers milling about on the road shoulder, one particularly valiant soul stood out. Apparently a leak had developed under the roadbed, not unusual considering the rainfall in the flat topography. Some planet-eating machine had gouged out a three-foot deep, ten-foot long trench in a successful effort to uncover the leak, left to battle the ceaseless stream of muddy water pouring into the trench looking as optimistic and confident as the little Dutch boy holding back the advancing Atlantic Ocean with his thumb in the cracked dike was a little old man bailing out the water with a styrofoam coffee cup. He would fill the cup, toss the water over the edge of the trench, and bend over again and over and over and over again. I'm assuming when he arrived at the trench the next morning, it would have filled up with water once more and he got to start the whole process over. How many hours, how many days, I wondered, did this guy dip his little Dixie cup into the ceaselessly filling trench? What the hell, it was a job in the Peruvian Amazon and China had $1.3 billion burning a hole in its pockets. You would think though that a $1.3 billion budget should be able to buy the old man a lousy five gallon bucket. As the day wore on, we began to catch up with and overtake some of the straggling moto taxi drivers. Apparently, their tightly knit parade had fallen apart somewhat since they had left Puerto Maldonado at noon. It seemed like every stop that offered even a hope of a cold or warm beer would have a swarm of their brightly colored metallic insects gathered outside, perhaps due to the confidence inspired by such stops, the proud motoristas would start challenging each other to see how much they could overload their small bikes ranging in the 125 to 150 cc range. My favorite of all was the undisputed champion of overloading a moto taxi, a brave and no doubt drunk fool pretty much sitting astride his gas tank who had defied all laws of physics by loading not one, not two, but three 55-gallon fuel drums on his little bike. I assume the drums were empty as 165 gallons of liquid weighs close to a ton, but I would not put anything past a proud Peruvian moto taxi driver on the biggest day of the year. The gaggle of giggling playboy bunnies began to grow restless as the sun started its slow descent into the west. I could see them looking hopefully out the window, though I had no clue what could raise the hopes of 14 playboy bunnies on a bus hurtling across the Amazon jungle, or what was left of it, short of a disco in the middle of nowhere. This mystery, like so many others in the Peruvian Amazon, was soon answered as the bus pulled into a regular little city of bright blue tarps. Hundreds of moto taxis jammed the road shoulders in the muddy field outside of my window. It was unclear to me whether this modern-day Amazonian 
Hooverville was built purely for the Moto Taxi celebration or whether it was a more permanent settlement to house the highway workers. Either way, it was a truly impressive display of Peruvian ingenuity and a great testament to the inventor of the blue plastic tarp. Where a gringo might see a boat cover, these guys saw a city of blue. There were blue tarped houses, blue tarped stores, blue tarped restaurants, but the crowning achievement of the blue tarp architecture and the source of so much giddiness and excitement among the Playboy bunnies was, you probably guessed it, a full-size blue tarped disco in the middle of nowhere. The bus hissed to a stop and every man on the bus signed in defeat as the tight bunch of nubile young bodies bounded off the bus and toward the disco to the absolute delight of about 600 drunk moto taxi drivers. And just in case you guys uh, have not figured this out on your own, who these young women were were prostitutes. They were whores for the gold miners. Uh, is uh, ex is who they were. There's a, a huge, huge problem with uh, prostitution and sex trafficking and all of that shit uh, related with uh, this gold mining shit down there and all over the planet. Anyway. <clears throat> We mounted on through the endless construction zone into the setting sun. In the final half hour of daylight, we began to climb out of the flat plain of the lowland rainforest and back into the first faint foothills of the Andes. Here the planet eaters had not quite struck with the ferocity that they, that they had hit the easy pickings flat forest yet anyway, and for just a few minutes I could sit back and enjoy the beauty of the soon-to-be-eaten hillside forest. Cap cresting the low, forest-covered mountain pass, we could see the lights of Mazuko blinking on below us. We careened down the hill at breakneck speed and landed in the middle of Labertino West a few minutes after dark. I could feel more than see the energy of the place, but even without being able to see much of it, I knew what was there. As the bus waited and waited and waited at the gas station, I said, screw this, fished my bag of cannonballs from the belly of the bus, and took a tuk-tuk the last half mile to my overpriced but otherwise fine hotel room complete with color TV and hot shower, even a bathtub, though it was cracked and held no water. I started to explore the gold mining town, but after three blocks, it was apparent I had seen the town before about 1,200 times between Guatemala and Peru. I stuffed a plate of chicken and rice in my face, argued briefly, and lost with a computer at speedy internet and called it a night, I needed to be well rested before the true descent into hell the following day. And that wraps up chapter 19, brings us to chapter 20, the final ascent into hell. Coming right up. Bye guys.